This is American History TV's Lectures in History podcast. This week, the role of coroners during the 19th century in the South, and how coroners shedding light on the emerging patterns of death within a society and through their record keeping could spot potential threats to public health. The class is taught by University of Georgia professor Stephen Berry. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm glad to see that we're all alive and well. You all have survived now seven weeks of American uh, history, death and dying in U.S. history. We've reached week seven. I'm Stephen Berry, your host for all things morbid. (laughs) Today, not any grimmer than any other day uh, in this class, we're going to be talking about the history of death investigation, the evolution of the system of death investigation in the United States, which really matures and comes of age at about the dawn of the 20th century. So it is a 19th century story of how death investigation becomes forensic science and ultimately uh, becomes the CSI series. Now, we all have a pretty lurid sense, I think, of death investigation that's provided by local news, right? This graphic is everywhere. I found a million of these, (laughs) right? It's always the same with the police tape and the chalk outlines. And uh, so we have a very lurid uh, sense uh, of death investigation from the if it bleeds, it leads school of uh, journalism in the United States. But I'm going to take the evolution of this system uh, very seriously and talk about how it's developed over time, starting with its historical importance. Now, the most obvious area in which uh, death investigation is critically important is to our criminal justice system. And this is the most familiar aspect, I'm sure, of death investigation uh, in the United States. Coroners and medical examiners, right, participate from the very beginning of any (coughs) death investigation, right? They are there on the scene. They pronounce a cause of death. That sets the entire investigation in motion. And then they're there with the death investigation throughout uh, the process until the very end when they may, uh, in fact, uh, testify at trial. Now, we can't imagine having a society without death investigation and its role in the criminal uh, justice system, right? It would be anarchy. Any one of those movies, right, where for a single day they decide that all laws are off and you can get away with whatever you can get away with. Uh, That's essentially what society would be. We would have murders, begetting reprisal killings in an endless cycle because we'd have no referees, arbiters, or experts to create something that approximates fairness, consequences, and precision in our legal system. So this is the very, very familiar aspect of death investigation in the United States, the role it serves in the criminal justice system. I want to call your attention to two other key roles that death investigators have played uh, throughout history apart from the criminal justice system. And these are less appreciated, uh, I think. The first is in public health. Death investigators are a critical uh, component to our public health system. And throughout our history, the coroner and the medical examiner have been on the front line in battles with many of our most mortal threats, raising the alarm and uncovering correlations and epidemics no one else has seen. You have to imagine them, right, as as I think too often happens. They're in a basement, uh, morbid, dank little place uh, doing their work, and yet what's washing across their examining tables, right, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, the rest of us may, in a bad life, see a death or two, they see hundreds. And so they're the first to sort of see patterns or shifts in how people are going out of the world. Uh, So they are the ones who sound the alarm. And I'll just give you a couple of examples, but you could multiply them a thousandfold. It's really the coroners at the turn of the 20th century who are calling attention to all the industrial accidents that we see as industrialization proceeds in our major cities. So in Pittsburgh in 1907, it's coroners who lead the charge against U.S. Steel, who has seen a rash of accidents that they don't want, right? The corporation itself doesn't want to advertise uh, this fact. It's the coroners and the ME's office who are seeing these things and leading the charge for improvements Uh, in industrial safety. The same thing is true, you guys might be familiar with this 1911 horrific fire uh, at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory uh, Company where 137 young women die, uh, some of them uh, of the flames and others had perished from leaping out of the eighth story of that building as it was set on fire. 
Nobody tells that story from the perspective of the coroners who really led the charge. They'd seen the damage. They'd seen this time and time again, well before uh, this one factory fire. Uh, they'd been dealing with this phenomenon. They were finally fed up. Uh, and so in 1911, they are the ones who lead the charge uh, for more industrial safety uh, around the areas of factory fires. Another example, in 1924 in Newark, New Jersey, it's a pathologist performing autopsies who discovers uh, that radium, the paint that they're using on watch dials, yeah. right? So uh, it was a great innovation in its day that your watch dial would be painted with this uh, radium paint uh, and would therefore uh, glow. But the way the workers worked with their brushes, they would always point the brush so that they could get a fine enough uh, line of paint. So they're constantly dipping this brush across their tongue that has had this radium on it. They're dying of necrosis of the jaw, anemia, and other problems. And it's really, again, the coroners who see not just one, right, my daughter dies under mysterious circumstances, but that's one instance. It's the coroner who sees tens, dozens of these kinds of cases and starts to see a pattern and starts to figure out what is, in fact, uh, going on. More examples. Uh, they're the first ones for traffic safety laws. Everybody gets their first car, right? They're overjoyed, they hit the road, uh, and then they hit a tree pretty shortly thereafter. So as soon as you have cars in the 1930s, you're starting to have massive accidents. There are cars that are not well-versed for safety. There are no stop signs. There are no traffic lights. Um, and so you're seeing more and more traffic fatalities. And you know it's one case here or there for those who experience it firsthand. But again, uh, for the coroner, it's happening in mass. And so here is a New York uh, medical examiner, 1938, uh, sorry, 1931. Our greatest source of danger to life and limb today is the operation of the automobile. Or a Wisconsin coroner in 1930, more lives were lost in Milwaukee over the past five years from automobiles than all the acute, acute contagious diseases combined. So you get this sense, right, that the, the, the coroner is like the canary in the coal mine, right? They're, they're the ones who really see the dangers that are coming at us as they come at us. I'll just give you a few more examples uh, that were interesting to me. Coroners are the first ones uh, to raise the alarm about needle sharing. It's this crazy 1933 case of heroin addicts in New York City who are getting malaria. Um, but again, they're the first ones uh, to see the pattern. They're the first ones to see an epidemic of uh, child abuse and spousal abuse among the working class uh, in the industrializing city. Uh, they're the first to sound the alarm about SIDS. They're the ones who discovered a sudden infant death syndrome and to see it as a, as a pattern, just more and more babies dying for no uh, apparently good reason. They sound the alarm about AIDS. Again, you can imagine these kinds of things, right? They get these cases where uh, the bo if it's needle sharing, right? They all oh, wait. They all seem to be addicts. As I make my investigation, they have these track marks. I wonder if, they, but they have malaria. This is kind of a curious combination. What could be going on here? Um, the same thing with AIDS and the body there. Cocaine-related homicides in the drug wars of the 80s. Again, it's the coroners who are saying, "Whoa, this is a raft of violence that I haven't seen uh, in my time here before." What exactly? Uh, is, is going on. The, the case that we're most familiar with, right, uh, Will Smith is in a new movie about concussions in football, and that's based on a real pathologist who worked at an Allegheny hospital uh, in Pittsburgh and started to diagnose uh, brain damage and repeated trauma to the head in American football players. Um, and that has become sort of a, a cause celebre. So this is that role that isn't that lurid uh, police line, chalk outline kind of sense of what, how important death investigation is to public health. Seeing patterns, raising the alarm about as our society evolves, what new dangers are there uh, that, we need to, that we need to deal with. And in a related uh, area in diagnostics, Okay, because they work with corpses, not patients, the truth is death investigators have really never gotten, I think, the sort of credit they deserve for their role in public health or the respect that they deserve from their medical peers. But the truth is they make their medical peers better. 
and this has been true uh, throughout history. I'll just give you one example here. At the turn of the 20th century, Massachusetts General Hospital made a major push to have all of its patients autopsied. This was the first time that a hospital said, okay, everybody who dies in this hospital is going to go down and have an autopsy, and we're going to see if the clinician was right, essentially. So the clinician said this person, madam, you have died of A. Um, and then the coroner said, no, no, no. And so they uncovered just how massively awful uh, their clinicians were in terms of diagnostics. And so what they said is, oh, well, this has to go the other way. Everyone, as part of their medical education, has to do autopsies and has to see these kinds of things uh, firsthand. So they paid an, uh, played an important role in improving medical diagnostics, uh, especially through the role of the autopsy, which is just the start, right, of the panoply of tools in their toolkit as forensic science evolved over the course of the 19th century uh, to produce, by the turn of the 20th century, our <coughs> modern-day uh, medical examiner. Now, Okay, at a conce I'm gonna just going to walk through some of these pretty quickly. At a conceptual, conceptual level, right, the autopsy has been around forever. So like that first Neanderthal, his Neanderthal buddy drops dead, and the guy's poking him with a stick and wondering what he died of. Uh, dude, I mean, that's, that's been around uh, essentially forever. They did an autopsy on Caesar, right? They discovered that it was actually that second stab that was the coup de grace, as they called it. First like, guy didn't do such a good job. Nope, nope, but they had 20, you know, 23 blows total, so... The second guy uh, uh, did him in. So autopsies have been around forever, but it, again, it's their systematic use that I think uh, changes. The two possible candidates for the father of the modern autopsy are there uh, on the right-hand side of the screen. One is Karl Rokotansky, 1804 to 1878. He presided over the Pathology Institute at the Allgemeine Krankenhaus in Vienna, which was really the hub of medical science. Uh, at the time, and so he had access to a ton and a ton of cases, and when I say a ton, I mean, wow, 70,000 autopsies he supervised, 30,000 autopsies he performed himself uh, over the course of his career. He averaged two a day, seven days a week, for 45 years. That is a ton and a ton of autopsies. And what he did was perfect it, again, as a system. How do we do it the same every time so we don't introduce any errors so we can ensure reproducible results? And to be honest, his disease theory was bad. He hated microscopy, so he hated to use the microscope. So he was actually, in, in terms of diagnosing diseases and the pathologies that killed people, he's actually not that great. But in terms of systematizing the autopsy and sort of publicizing it, making it uh, an important part, uh, he played a key role. Rudolf Virchow, 1821 to 1902, maybe even more important uh, as the eminent father of the modern autopsy. He's a German pathologist, uh, basically the hub of medical knowledge in the 19th century, moves from Vienna to Berlin because of Virchow. He's the one who really seals the deal on the case that cellular pathology is the cause of disease. You guys will remember this probably. Hippocrates and Galen all thought that when we had diseases, it was our humors, right, that were out of balance. We had these four humors, and they circulate throughout our body. And that's why they draw blood, right, is to sort of reestablish balance. He's like, that's garbage, because he, is, he worships the microscope. He loved it. So in addition to doing autopsies, he brought the microscope very much to the center of death investigation. So he deserves, I think, to be called the father uh, of the modern autopsy. I'll just say both of these things come to the United States um, fairly quickly in the 19th century. The most influential there, not depicted here, is this guy, Sir William Osler. Uh, he'd studied with both of these men, and then he came to Canada, and then ultimately to the United States, where he becomes the most respected and revered North American physician of his time. Uh, he not only performed autopsies, taught people to do it, sort of made it the cause celebre uh, in medicine. In speaking of himself, he told a friend, I've been watching this case, meaning his own medical case, for two months, and I'm sorry that I shall not see the postmortem. That's how committed he was to <laughs> autopsies that he wasn't going to be able to do his own, which he would have loved more than anything else. To his credit, he was right. Everything that was wrong with him when they did an autopsy on him, and sure enough, he was, in fact, right about that. So autopsy had been around forever, but what I'm talking about, when does it become systematized? A systematized part of forensic science and medicine 
Again, that's the turn of the 20th century. Same thing with floating the lungs. That actually had been around forever. Does anybody know what that is? OK, this is going to get morbid. We, oh, we talked about that already. So in the case of a baby who is born, and you want to figure out <coughs> if the mother has committed infanticide or if the baby was born dead, what you would do is you would take the lungs of the baby and you would submerge them in water. And the idea was, if the baby had drawn breath, right, then their they the lungs would be aerated, and so they would float on the surface of the water. If the baby had never drawn a breath and it had been born, stillborn, um, then the lungs would actually sink. You can do the same thing with drowning victims to see if, if they've drowned because they've taken so much water into their lungs, right? The lungs should sink uh, as opposed to float. They've been doing that since 1681 um, in the case of infanticide. Now, we don't rely on this that much anymore. Uh, to be honest, they've proven that it is inaccurate in at least 2% of cases. Uh, this is going to get even more gross. If the, as the body decomposes, right, uh, gases are released. That's the bloating that you see, for instance, in a Civil War corpse. The same thing's true in a baby's lungs. So if, if the corpse is decaying, then there, the lungs will essentially have gases in them that will have them float. And so it's not great. 2% isn't bad for that era in terms of you know, a degree of error, unless you're one of the women, right, who's convicted yeah. of infanticide. Uh, then that 2% doesn't look uh, very good uh, at all. Blood stain, this is blood stain pattern analysis. This is sort of what Dexter uh, makes uh, uh, famous. Uh, 8% of our weight is blood, so we have five liters of blood in us, and it runs very close to the surface. So anytime you have a trauma, right, you're going to release blood, and it has all these residues in it that make it very, very difficult to clean. Um, again, you can imagine that, you know, blood stains had been used for death investigation for time out of mind. Oh, this guy was killed here. Oh, he was dragged over here. Hey, that guy has blood on his hand. That isn't what we're talking about here with the uh, splatter analysis and blood typing. Blood typing comes of age in 1907. So the A, the B, the AB, the O, all of that uh, is in, in 1907. They come up with these blood tests. They use them for paternity, as you can imagine. Is that my kid or not my kid? Um, but they also use it in death investigation. And then uh, the BPA, the blood stain pattern analysis, that's 1895. It goes back that far uh, that you have your first scientific papers focused specifically on how blood coagulates, how quickly it dries, whether arterial blood is a little brighter, and then the splatter analysis. What kind of motion produces what kind of results uh, in the blood stain on the wall? Fingerprints, too, goes way back, but systematized at the turn of the 20th century. So uh, they used to sign ancient contracts in Babylon. You would stick your thumb in the clay tablet that the contract is chiseled into. Uh, right? So they, and even in the 1200s, they knew that fingerprints, uh, in Asia at least, they knew fingerprints were totally unique, and they would use them uh, in death investigation. But it didn't come immediately uh, to the United States until after 1902. There's this very uh, famous case called the Sheffer case, in which this guy murders someone in his apartment and then uh, busts a glass cabinet door open and he leaves a partial print on one of the shards. And so they can prove, because it's a partial, right, that it was left after the glass had been broken. It wasn't there before. It wasn't a print that had been broken in half. It was essentially, uh, he'd only put his finger on part of it. And it's the first case, 1902, in France, where they convict somebody on the basis of fingerprint analysis. Juries were slow to accept it, as you can imagine. <laughs> you know, people had never really thought about uh, of fingerprints, but it moves to the United States pretty quickly. By 1906 in New York, uh, uh, basically they're fingerprinting every criminal that comes through uh, New York City um, and making cases on the base of fingerprints. Other examples, the blood alcohol uh, content uh, test. Death investigators pioneered the BAC test and then the breathalyzer, which comes way earlier than you would uh, guess. Even today, 30% of traffic fatalities probably have something to do with alcohol. In the 1950s and 60s, it's 50%. It's probably higher than that uh, before. Uh, and so having a blood alcohol test and a breathalyzer test was unbelievably critical. Uh, that picture of the his and hers breathalyzer test, nothing more romantic 
Uh, it's from 1927, uh, an issue of uh, Science and Invention. So you have all of these guys crazily running to create a great patent uh, for a breathalyzer test. Even forensic dentistry uh, goes way back and then becomes stabilized uh, around 1900. The first case of using forensic dentistry in court, this is just absolutely crazy. It's the Salem witchcraft trials. <laughs> There's a guy, the uh, Reverend George Burroughs is accused of rich witchcraft. Their evidence is that he's biting all of these people. Of course, these people are probably biting themselves and just accusing him. But they admit this and use it in the court. He's convicted. Uh, he's hung. Later, they say, I'm sorry, you know, to his kids and, and, uh, and, and, and pay them. But, uh, so it's an ignominious early uh, uh, form of uh, bite mark analysis and forensic dentistry. But we all know. Uh, by the 1870s, right, uh, forensic dentistry is, and dental records are a key part of uh, murder investigations. So all of this comes of age in 1900. And I want you to see the historical importance that the coroners and MEs have played in our public health system, in diagnostics, uh, and the forensic science, the, the toolkit that they developed over that period. That said, there have been some real problems uh, with our death investigation system in the United States. Given uh, its importance, granting all due respect for its successes, we have a deeply flawed uh, system of death investigation in the United States. Now, modern day MEs and coroners, right, they operate uh, in a very complex environment. It's not always clear if they have legal authority uh, to do an autopsy against the interests <coughs> of the family. They've got prosecutors putting their demands. They've got organ transplant specialists sitting by their side. Is he dead yet? Is he dead yet? Um, they've got tough calls to make about euthanasia, assisted suicide. I understand. Coroners and modern-day medical examiners work in a difficult environment. They also have a rich history of corruption and incompetence. Think about, it's, it's flipping how important death investigation is means that whoever controls the coroner's office controls the justice system. The wheels of justice don't turn until the coroner makes some kind of pronouncement about a cause of death and sets those wheels in motion. So if you don't want those wheels to move, buy off the coroner. So here's a great case. In the 1950s, a man was found bobbing in Biscayne Bay, blindfolded with a knife in his back. And the coroner ruled it a suicide. <laughs> <laughs> right, you can just imagine the mob bosses who could control a coroner. Uh, the investigation into this death would uh, never get started. Even if coroners didn't stoop that low, right, you can imagine they routinely got kickbacks for steering bodies to particular under undertakers. You can imagine they get money for releasing crime scene photos uh, and other bits of nastiness from their own exam tables. And this is the gnarliest bit, uh, quite frankly. It wasn't until 1968 that we had the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act, which said that coroners and MEs couldn't take anything out of the body before it was put in the ground. Not until 1968. So we're sort of all familiar with the ghouls, as they were called, the grave robbers in the early 19th century who would steal whole bodies for uses at the medical college. And we know that that practice went out of favor. But the degree to which they used organs from dead bodies to do pathology tests, there's a great deal of that all the way through uh, 1968. There was a massive trade in human growth hormone, which you get from the pituitary gland. We would never be able to do this, but if you dig up tons and tons of bodies, that were buried before 1968. I wonder how many of them have their pituitary glands, quite frankly, uh, because the coroners could make uh, all kinds of money selling them on the black uh, market. Um, just some examples. A Dallas ME in the 1940s was in the habit of dropping dead babies on their heads to learn about injury patterns. They're doing this in the name of science in this case, but they're doing it without the consent of uh, the parents. Uh, a Tacoma, Washington forensic pathologist routinely stabbed corpses to try to develop, uh, he was writing a paper on knife wounds 
essentially, again, trying to advance uh, science. A Milwaukee ME in the 1930s collected the testicles from the dead to test theories about heroin use and sterility. And none of that was illegal prior to 1968. So uh, at the end of the class, right, we'll read Mary Roach's book, Stiff. And I'll ask you at the end of that class whether we're in a better place now or whether you would devote, uh, donate your body to science. She writes a lot about cases where if you donate your body to science, one possibility, not inevitable, and you can avoid this, but one possibility is that your decapitated head will be used to test lipstick. Um, <laughs> and that counts as having donated your body to science. So uh, there are some problems uh, with corruption and interests uh, in our death investigation system and problems of uh, incompetence uh, too. Uh, death investigation in the United States is one of the least professionalized, least standardized areas of American uh, medicine. This issue actually bubbles to the surface every once in a while and then we just sort of tamp it back down and pretend not to notice. So I'm just going to walk you through a few high profile disasters for death investigation in the United States. Starting there uh, with John F. Kennedy, right? <laughs> there is probably no autopsy that has been met with greater derision uh, than Kennedy's. He was taken uh, not to anywhere in Dallas after he was shot. He was taken to Bethesda Naval Hospital uh, I, because he was a Navy man, right? And his wife thought they would treat his body with greater dignity. Um, and maybe they did, uh, but they're a Naval Hospital, right? They're not really accustomed to dealing with gunshot wounds of any kind, much less the President of the United States with a wound of this nature. Um, and then they've got Secret Service people around, the Kennedy family is around. Uh, they got a lot wrong. They thought there were only two bullets, they couldn't identify the wound track. Um, with two Navy hospital pathologists operating in a confused, intense environment, it is a wonder the autopsy report turned out as good as it did, which wasn't very good, was the official finding of the Warren uh, Commission. You guys won't remember this because you weren't alive, but I remember this. That, uh, Michael Jordan, of course, one of the greatest athletes of all time. There's a famous phrase, Michael Jordan is better at basketball than anyone has ever been good at anything. Like you can just compare apples and oranges. If you would, did that for a minute, he was absolutely fantastic. And he was very, very close with his father. Um, so his father was murdered in 1993 in Marlboro County, uh, South Carolina. Marlboro County, South Carolina, had a, the coroner, the official coroner for Marlboro County, South Carolina, was a part-time coroner and part-time construction worker. He said he didn't have enough room in the fridge for this very unfortunately decomposed body. He'd been basically carjacked. His body had been thrown into a swamp uh, where it decomposed. So he didn't have anywhere to store it, so he just put it in the oven. Um, now, fortunately, he saved the teeth. I'm not even quite sure why. Uh, but this became a major investigation, as you can imagine. 1993, Michael Jordan was, I don't know, one of the greatest stars on the planet. Uh, and the loss of his father was a, a real black eye uh, for pathology in the United States. The uh, coroner in this case, I, I just love this quote, said, I guess I've done for the Coroner's Association what Tanya Harding did for figure skating. Um, it was, yes, just a disaster. And ripped from the headlines, right, is Antonin Scalia, um, who, quite frankly, probably should have had an autopsy, given how high profile his case is. Guy had all kinds of health problems. Uh, he was old. Uh, he was way overweight. Um, he, was, he had all kinds of risks. I'm sure a heart attack is uh, probably uh, what claimed his life. But the, like with Kennedy, the conspiracy theories that follow in the wake of failing to do any kind of analysis uh, is a problem. So you guys know the story, right? This is very recent. He was uh, hunting at a little uh, Mexican uh, border town on a remote ranch. He was found dead by the ranch owner who said, uh, we discovered the judge in bed, a pillow over his head. And then what happens? It's remote Texas, right? And again, it's Texas. So they don't actually, they don't fly him over, they don't take him to Miami, or he was pronounced dead with a cause of death by phone, essentially, because that's the way our system works. It has all kinds of holes in it. Uh, and then once uh, Trump uh, hears about this, 
He says, it's a t horrible topic, but they say they found a pillow on his face, which is a pretty unusual place to find a pillow. And then Michael Savage, the conservative radio host, this is going to be bigger and bigger and bigger. We need the equivalent of a Warren Commission, uh, essentially the uh, notion that a Supreme Court justice has been snuffed out uh, with a pillow over his face. None of that would happen if we had a standardized system of death investigation. These are just the high profile uh, disasters. Uh, quite frankly, we don't have a system. That's part of the problem. As late as 2009, in its report, Strengthening Forensic Science in the United States, A Path Forward, the National Academy of Science, Sciences lamented, death investigation in the United States is fragmented, deficient, hodgepodge, and disjointed. And the reason, as I say, is we don't have a system. What we essentially have is the medical examiner whose goals should be, aren't always, justice and science, overlaid on top of a much, much older system, the system of the coroner. And it's the system of the coroner that I want to talk about um, for the rest uh, of our lecture today. Now, I don't want to turn coroners into the villains of this story. Um, that's not my point. Many of the advancements that I laid out at the beginning, at the Triangle Shirt Waste Factory and all that, those were coroners who discovered, they were on the front lines of our public health and discovered these real threats to us um, and came forward. So I don't at all want to slight them. I do want to say, I'm an historian, so I want to talk about what's in their DNA, that is to say, the coroner's office going way back for time out of mind is not interested in justice or science, which we would hope they would be. It's always been interested in something else, something approximating that, but not exactly uh, the same. So does anybody know where the word coroner comes from? Corona, that's Latin for crown. Yeah, so in, um, in Hamlet, right, they call the coroner a crowner. Essentially, he's a representative of the king. Okay, so what you could do is think back, way back into medieval England, um, and you've got the sheriff, right, of Nottingham, who's squeezing the peasants and taking all of their money, and none of that money is going up to the king, so the king invents the coroner. The king essentially needs someone who can go around the sheriff and make sure that revenue is running where it ought, which is to the king's coffers. So think of the coroner as essentially the king's vulture. So it's constantly sort of flying around. And whenever there's a dispute or a problem, the vulture descends to see if, whoa, 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 someone must represent the king's interest here uh, and make sure that he gets his end. Well, what would that have to do with deaths? Wherever you have a death, right, property is loosed from its legal mooring. Is this guy a taxpayer? Does he owe money? Who does he owe money to? Uh, did he commit suicide? If he committed suicide, that's a crime against religion. The king seizes the estate. Here's uh, the craziest one. If they found a dead Norman on the village commons, they assessed a tax on the whole village called the murderum, which is where we get the word murder. Uh, comes from this very ancient system of the coroner. Wherever you see a coroner, you see the English imprint. Things didn't go this way in France and Germany and other places. They developed a medical examiner system much earlier. Only in places that have that British imprint, British colonies or Britain itself, do you have the office of the coroner. Okay, so one of the things I'd like to suggest um, is that the coroner is really a creature of the state. Instead of the thinking of the coroner as someone on the side of justice or on the side of science, and that's what's evolving uh, in this period, really just a creature of the state. If the state is on the side of justice, if the state is on the side of science, well, then the coroner might be there too. If the state has other interests that it's protecting or other preoccupations, then the coroner will be the tool of those interests and captured by those preoccupations. Ah, and here we arrive at our assignment uh, for the coming weeks. To illustrate the point that I've just made, that the coroner is not 
in his or her DNA necessarily. The origins of the office is not necessarily in science and justice, but in representing the interests of the state. We're going to do uh, a little object lesson by doing a deep dive into the coroner's reports from the 19th century South using CSI Dixie, which you can find at csidixie.org. What this site does is it takes 1,582 inquests that were done in South Carolina between 1800 and 1900. It digitizes them. That is, you can read, a trans you can, you can read the original uh, record, but it also datifies them. Was this a homicide? Was this a suicide? Was this an accidental death? All of that. Okay, just to get a sense of what they look like, what you'll see as you get into this assignment. These are the coroner's reports as I first came across them when I was at the South Carolina Department of Archives and History. You guys know I'm one morbid dude, right? I have been fixated on death uh, since I was a little kid. And I think I was always destined to open this box of coroner's reports in South Carolina. The minute I opened it, I was just, how many are in here? It's all endings, right? I'll know nothing of the noon of any of these lives, like the happy moments in all of these lives, perfectly lost to me. I'll only know the end. And every time I pick it up, it doesn't end well. Right? They all end different. They do. They all end the same. And for this weird moment, right, I figured, that's true of all of us. We'll all end different. We all end the same. Nobody's ever escaped mortality. And so in that moment, in that meeting room in the South Carolina Department of Archives and History, it was like... As Poe would have it, death was looking gigantically down. And I could feel that I was going, everyone on the, in the reading room floor, we were all making our varied ways to the grave, just like everybody else in this box. And I became fixated uh, by them, and that's part of why I put uh, this project together and why I'm inflicting it upon you uh, <laughs> so that you can become fixated on them too. Here you see the, rep the, the, the business with the state, right? Is it, so this is the state versus the dead body of Ellick, slave property of H.B. English. It's just a weird way of writing it. And, and even in legal terms, right, when you commit murder, you don't commit the murder against a person. You commit the murder against the peace and dignity of the state. So the state, it's not money anymore, but the state has an interest that it's uh, protecting uh, in all of these cases, uh, to some degree, uh, the rule of law. Okay, so this is how I found them. They were just sort of a jumbled little mass, trifolded little bundles, a bunch of endings. Now we've got 1,582 of them that you guys are going to uh, jump into. Let me just show you how they work so that you won't get confused when you're actually working on the assignment. Every one of them has what I call a cover sheet, kind of. It's not like, it doesn't look like a form. Uh, but it's pretty well standardized and standardized by law. So in this case, it's the state of South Carolina, Kershaw District, which South Carolina was districts and then it became counties. An inquisition indented, that means taken, uh, in the woods near William Gardner's. And it always starts with that. So an inquest has to take place where the body lies. You're not supposed to move it. You're supposed to leave it there. Um, so in this case, this inquest has taken place in the woods near William Gardner's. You always get a date, the fourth day of January in the year of our Lord, 1817. You get a coroner. In this case, he's a justice of the quorum. I won't even get into what that is. You get a dead guy. In this case, the body of Alexander McKee. You get the jurors. In this case, right, ev white men, all white men, 12 white men. Um, and then you get this phrase, which I became sort of addicted to finding in every one of these, do say upon their O's, do say upon, it became a sort of rhapsody thing for me, because that was always my cue that somebody's walking out. Uh, in this case, McKee became deranged or insane. He escaped from his family. He died of exposure. This is an era in which, right, they don't, they would routinely treat people with problems at home. Uh, and so they'd essentially locked their loved one up and he escaped. Yeah. So I guess like... There's no like mental right. like institution right. to take care of stuff like right. that. Right. So so not in eighteen seventeen. Well you'll you'll start to see in South Carolina and other places uh, reform movements for uh, penitentiary uh, you know, facilities for the deaf, dumb, blind, insane, uh, other kinds of improvements, uh, but not in eighteen seventeen. You had to take care of it at home. 
And in this case, as I say, he escaped uh, and died of exposure. So that's just the cover sheet. Um, as, uh, and it's, it's mostly boilerplate legalese, but it get, does give you some data. But that, what I'm saying is it's a trifold little bundle. That's just one of the pages in a typical uh, coroner's report. In this case, what you have is a dissenting opinion, what I would call the minority report. So in this case, uh, a guy named Gino, uh, this is in South Carolina, had been charged to take a slave to the slave jail, essentially, and the slave uh, was injured and couldn't walk fast enough. And so Gino lashed a chain around his neck and dragged him until he was dead. And 11 jurors said, well, and this guy was like, are you kidding? Undoubtedly a racist, undoubtedly in support of slavery. But he thought that there were some boundaries, at least. And so he writes this minority report. And you get the testimony of women and slaves. They can't testify at trial, but they can testify here before a coroner's inquest. So in this case, it's, it's written out right by the coroner himself or another white man. So it's testimony that moves through white patriarchy to be documented. But it's at least their version of what happens. So we get cases where an inquest jury in the, uh, finds that a slave woman had died of apoplexy, but her daughter says, my mom was hit with a shovel. So we get traces of what really happened in these inquest files. And you get some hint of the poor whites of the antebellum South. In this case, every one of these people are making their mark. I just want you to be familiar with that. So this says William Hall. He can't actually write his name. The coroner has written his name for him, and then his mark, and then he just put an X right there. And that all of these, they're all white men, but they're all illiterate uh, in this case. So you get <clears throat> much more. Uh, evidence than just the cover sheet in one of these inquests. We don't really know what an inquest looked like. There are not many people have left us descriptions of what it was like to be in an inquest. This is nothing we do now, right? We don't, so somebody dies and you leave the body there for a long time and then you get 12 people to stand over it and then call in other people to sort of say, oh yeah, I saw that guy walk past me, you know, two hours ago or whatnot. We just don't do it that way. They did it uh, that way, and I, actually this is a, a cartoon from 1826, and I actually think it's pretty good at getting at uh, what an inquest was like. You won't be able to read this, but one of the jurors says, the man's alive, sir, for he has opened one eye. And the coroner, sir, the doctor declared him dead two hours since, and he must remain dead, sir, so I shall proceed with the inquest. So what's going on here? What do you notice? Who's this guy, probably? So this guy probably owns the house. This is, you have to be able to decode uh, the, the way they would draw things uh, in the 19th century. Well-fed, well-warmed, clearly high class, uh, given the wig and, 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 and whatnot his cowering dog here. So this, is, this guy is the homeowner. These guys code for lower class. They're the jurors uh, of the inquest. They always would write them with repulsive faces and, and just sort of, you know, the unkempt uh, hair. So these guys are poorer. And so what you see here is sort of overlapping layers of authority uh, in this one really cramped space. So there's the authority of the state, right, who's sort of brought them all here to discover if someone has murdered against the peace and dignity of the state. Um, you get medical authority in the form of uh, the doctor who's already made his pronouncement. This is actually a religious figure. I don't know if you can see, but he has a collar. Religion's legitimacy inheres in sort of giving meaning to our mortality and explaining to us what we should do uh, with our feelings when bad things happen. Why does God allow these things to happen? So there's the authority of religion. There's actually the, an authority to local knowledge too. 
So, okay, these guys aren't as well-fed as this guy. They don't have as nice a house. But they actually know that the guy's not dead, right? So they have an authority uh, based on, on local circumstance. And then there's sort of this authority, to me at least, of death itself, because they're all crammed into this one space, and they're really facing death together in the same uh, intimate place. So I want you to remember that when you're working on your assignment, that that inquest was the product of this cultural process of grappling with uh, death and coming to some kind of conclusion. These guys, right, are probably not interested exactly in science or in justice, per se. They have a more supple sense of things. This is a book by one of my friends, Laura Edwards. She's at Duke, The People and Their Peace, Legal Culture and the Transformation of Inequality in the Post-Revolutionary South. Which is sort of think about this book uh, as you're working on your inquests. Her argument is essentially uh, that what was most important in this period was the peace, not justice. What is the peace? Whatever was true yesterday should be true tomorrow. So when you have a death, you have a rift in the peace. And those 12 men, 13 men, they are essentially trying to come to some sort of satisfactory conclusion and return us to the peace. So state level law gets made, but at the county level, where you have the coroner's inquest, their life is much more supple. Laws are often ignored. Um, and that's why women and slaves can testify, she suggests, because it's not exactly a legal proceeding or a judicial proceeding. It's a proceeding of the community to restore order to the community. So women and slaves testify in an inquest because they know what was true yesterday and what should maybe be true tomorrow. And so it's very different than our sense of right, the FBI or the sheriff's office, all of these people whose whole function is to compel us to obey the law. This is a different sort of uh, endeavor altogether, she's suggesting. OK, um, I want to sort of aggregate those 1,582 cases uh, for us uh, to just give you a sense of what I learned from doing, from seeing this a lot, all of those trifold little bundles, what came out of that uh, massive box. To tell you the truth, what came out is what I should have known before I started and what a social worker would have told me in two seconds. So I did all of this work. I digitized 1,582 cases. I datafied all of it to discover, OK, like a social worker would have come to me and said, OK, tell me about this place. And I said, well, it's a land of massive rural poverty. It's a land where most whites are radically underemployed. It's a land of rampant alcoholism. It's a land where they teach nobody to swim, where there are no social services, uh, where there are no treatment for addiction, where there is no access to birth control. And she or he would have told me, OK, I'm going to tell you exactly what it'll look like from the morgue. They don't teach their kids to swim, so they're going to drown. They have no access to birth control, so you're going to have massive numbers of unwanted pregnancies. So you're going to have a massive number of dead babies. You have massively angry, underemployed, alcoholic fathers. You're going to have a decimating amount of spousal abuse and child abuse. And you're going to have souls so desperate that they will hang themselves before they'll live in that world anymore. And so what I now know, if you were a white male in Spartanburg County, South Carolina, between 1840 and 1880, and the coroner standing above your body, how did you die? A combination of alcohol and stupidity. So we have this idea, right, of the Old South, particularly as this place of knife fights and eye gouging and dueling. It's so much sadder than that. If you were a white female, Spartanburg County, South Carolina, same period, corner standing above your body, how did you die? You hung yourself. And if you were an African American male, you hung yourself and weren't hung by somebody else. So it's a land, no social services. 
It's a place where white men are drinking themselves and their dependents to death, essentially. A land of massive rural poverty and inequality. And that's the way people go out of the world uh, in such a place. OK, your assignment is going to be to write up one inquest as a narrative story. Take it as a starting point and use it to tell me something about life and death in the 19th century South. So you just take one case and you try to peel it like an onion. Tell its story, but also try to branch out. And to give you an example, I'm going to end with one story told from CSI Dixie and the inquest there. It is uh, the story of the deaths of James Cook, Moses Parks, Alan Attaway, David Phillips, Hampton Stevens, and Albert Minyard uh, in Hamburg, South Carolina in 1876. So this is where we'll end with this uh, one story uh, from a set of inquests in the CSID uh, case set. This map I know is probably hard for you all to see. Uh, Hamburg is right here. It is directly across the Savannah River from Augusta. Just if you can orient yourself to Augusta, you're practically in Hamburg. Hamburg is directly across the way. So here is the Savannah River, which is rolling down uh, to the sea here. And here is the port at Charleston, one of the most important cities uh, in the antebellum uh, south. So Hamburg had been settled in 1820 by uh, Henry Schultz, who named the town after the famous city right in his native Germany. It quickly became a hub of wagon traffic would come here, uh, pulling cotton from the interior of the south. At first, in 1820, right, we don't have railroads yet, most of that cotton is then going by uh, river, by Savannah River, to ports here, and then carried uh, to Charleston uh, by, uh, by boat. So that's uh, 1820. By 1825, they build this Hamburg to Charleston Railroad. And this is the B&O, right, is a famous, famous common carrier, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. If you look on Wikipedia right now, it will say that it was the longest common carrier in the United States. No, because everybody forgets about the Hamburg to Charleston line. Chartered in 1827, it was the world's largest radio, uh, railroad in its completion in 1833. In its heyday, 60,000 bales of cotton worth $2 million moved through Hamburg each year. Yeah. And I'm guessing that like this area that prior to that had a lot of wagon traffic is yeah. now economically depressed because yeah. there's like no more right. traffic. Right. Well, and, and, and that's what we'll see um, uh, uh, especially afterward. What happens to Hamburg? Uh, is that it becomes a spur town, right? You're familiar with these, where the railroad essentially goes around it or finds another uh, uh, route. And so uh, by 1876, uh, Hamburg is a ghost town, essentially. And what you have after the Civil War is African Americans specialized in these places. The problem if you're African American after the Civil War, is it, part of it is real estate. What real estate do you actually own? None. 40 acres and a mule, forget about it. Um, you, don't, you don't own anything. And so we're sort of all familiar with the degree to which the African-American church <clears throat> becomes the center of its, not just religious life, but political life and civic life. Part of it is a real estate problem. That's the one building they have. That's the one building they own. And so it becomes a schoolhouse and a rec center and a political incubator and a place where people gather. It is everything to them. <laughs> So when they're firebombing churches, they're doing far more than attacking just the spirit of the African-American community. Um, it's a real estate problem. So anyway, African-Americans specialized in these depressed little towns because they'd been great once, right? But now they're totally left behind. They're a ghost town. You could buy this real estate for relatively cheap. And you can erect an African-American town where you can safeguard uh, yourself, your kids, uh, and your community. So that's what Hamburg is by 1876. Uh, it essentially has 600 residents. A fifth of them are white. A fifth of them are fine living in a majority African-American community. They're like, this is great. I, I, I like Hamburg. So here's the story that I would tell uh, about Hamburg in 1876. So July 4, 1876, right? It's the 100-year birthday of the United States. 
And the President of the United States, uh, Ulysses S. Grant, tells, says, what should we do to celebrate? Well, every town should have a parade, which means a sort of militia march. And they should write the town's history. And they should read the Declaration of Independence. And we'll sort of collect all those town histories, and it'll be a biography of America. And this is going to be great. So that's the idea, July 4, 1876. Uh, remember, majority African-American town. They have an African-American militia. Their guns are terrible. They have no bullets. Doesn't matter. They're marching. They're having a good time. They've read the Declaration of Independence, uh, and they're marching here on the center square of the African-American town of Hamburg, which they have bought with their own money. And right here uh, is a wagon with two boys in it, uh, a guy named Tommy Butler and Henry Getson. And they're watching. Uh, these guys march under their militia cam um, uh, captain, a guy named uh, Doc Adams. And this was one witness who remembered them marching. They were most equal to any company, white or colored, no matter where they came from. Adams, the militia captain, had them well drilled. That was the great fault. So Henry Getson and Tommy Butler actually belonged to the Butler Plantation to get there they have to come across the river from Augusta, where they've done whatever trading, by wagon, and then loop around to the fa their father's plantation, which is over here. So they're constantly having to come through uh, Hamburg on their way to Augusta and from their plantation. And it's driving them crazy that this is such a successful African-American town. It's driving them crazy, probably, that these are black men with guns, um, that they're so well-ordered and well-drilled, that they're so happy on July 4, 1876. This represents everything that they don't want to see in the history of the United States. So they drive their wagon directly into the parade. They could easily have gone around. This is actually a really large field. They could have gone around just easily. They don't. They drive directly uh, up uh, to the parade. And they demand that Doc Adams uh, essentially disperse his militia. He says, I don't know why I would do that. I mean, this is what the President of the United States had wanted all of his towns to do. Uh, Getson says, doesn't matter. This is the rut I always travel, which I just sort of like that mentality. This is the rut I travel. I cannot be in a new place, in a new space, think a new thought. This is the rut I always travel. So uh, Doc Adams relents, and he says, open order, which is essentially uh, make a hole. They do, and then all of the militia goes home on what had been sort of a depressing end to the 4th of July. The next day, Tommy Butler, Henry Getson, and his father come uh, to the sheriff's office at Hamburg to swear out a warrant on Doc Adams, his militia, for obstructing a public road. There they meet Prince Rivers. I want to tell you the story. Prince Rivers is one of the more remarkable uh, stories uh, from Reconstruction. He's the town just, the, 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 essentially uh, the trial justice in the town. He's also the mayor of Hamburg. He's also the general of the militia. Uh, <coughs> so he wears, he wears a lot of hats. So they come to his office uh, to swear out uh, this complaint. I want to just give you a little bit of a backstory. This is the best picture we have of uh, Prince Rivers. He had been born in slavery. He taught himself to read and write. He was a carriage driver in Beaufort, uh, South Carolina. As soon as the Civil War starts, he jumps on his carriage horse and rides it to freedom. He joins the United States Colored Troops. He becomes a sergeant. He's attacked in New York because he has uh, chevrons on his, and even whites there don't want to see a black officer. And he more than holds his own. This guy was one tough hombre. His own commander, Thomas Wentworth Higginson, said that Rivers had no equal. There is not a white officer in this regiment who has more administrative ability. No anti-slavery novel has described a man of such marked ability. If his education had reached a higher point, I see no reason why he should not command the Army of the Potomac. And if there should ever be a black monarchy in South Carolina, he will be its king. He didn't become the king of South Carolina, as we know, but he was known as the Black Prince. He was the power of Aiken County. So Edgefield County, the most unreconstructed county in South Carolina, has a county carved out of it 
and he's trying to make a go of interracial democracy in Hamburg, in Aiken County, in South Carolina, at the height of Reconstruction. So, he's got these angry white men who have this ridiculous notion that they're going to drag his militia captain out to some legal bushes and beat the man to death. He says, well, maybe these guys are drunk, or they're hotheads, or let's let uh, cooler heads prevail. So he says, come on back in a few days. I'll have Doc Adams here. We'll have some of the militia people here. We'll see if we can uh, settle this. A couple days later, Matthew Calbraith Butler, no relation, probably some relation, but you know how the South is, uh, <laughs> to, the, to the Butler boys, uh, shows up at Prince, uh, Prince River's office. This guy uh, is totally uh, unreconstructed. Uh, in his first run at Congress, he had lost uh, to a black man. Uh, he tried to take it out on local blacks. They burnt down his house. Uh, utterly unreconstructed, as I say. This is a quote from one of his friends. With all of his beautiful manners, when he wanted to be, he could be the most cold-blooded, insolent human being that mortal eyes ever beheld. So he said he was there as General Butler. I don't know if he thinks his Confederate service isn't over. I don't know what's going on. He says he's there as the butler's lawyer, but also there as General Butler. He demands that the militia come to him, that they stack their arms and surrender those, and that Doc Adams formally apologize to the Butler boys for how they treated uh, them on the 4th of July. Uh, Prince Rivers asked if they did all that, would Butler vouch uh, for their safety? Butler said, it is owing to how they apologized to Mr. Butler for how they treated his sons uh, on the 4th. So, here's our situation. Most of the militia is holed up. This is where the parade had been days before. Most of the militia is holed up here at the armory. They maybe have 120 rounds of ammo. Their guns are really quite poor. So the gun that fought the Civil War we think of as such a breakthrough, this, you know, uh, rifled musket on the shoulder of every uh, man in the army, but it's the Winchester. That technology comes in right after the Civil War. We think of it as the gun that won the West. It's the gun that won the South. So the African Americans in their armory have 120 rounds of ammo and really crummy guns. Uh, by comparison, the people who start flooding into Hamburg, coming across the bridge from Augusta, many of them are carrying Winchesters. And they're we have strong accounts that they bought the local uh, grocer out of alcohol. So by 6 p.m. that evening, they are well drunk. Uh, and the folks in the army, armory are starting to worry about what's going to happen. About 6 o'clock, uh, they open fire on the armory. The armory returns fire, maybe did or maybe didn't, kill one guy, McKee Merriweather. He might have been killed by his own dudes. We have no idea. He'd promised earlier in the day that he was going to kill everybody in the armory and then go to heaven and kill Jesus Christ himself. Anyway, McKee Merriweather falls here. All bets are off. They, take a, they drag a cannon across the bridge from Augusta. They blow a hole in the armory. African-American militiamen and otherwise escape out the back of the armory. Many of them are captured, and they're carried uh, to the dead ring, which is uh, right there. And as it happens... We have surviving witness uh, who was in the dead ring uh, that day. One of the men there was lieutenant <coughs> in the militia. Remember, Doc Adams controls the militia. His lieutenant is a man named Charles Attaway. He was in the dead ring, and he turned to a friend and says, Mays, what do you think of this? Attaway asked the man sitting next to him. Jack Mays had been a cook in the Union Army. Now, by all accounts, he ran a gambling operation in Hamburg. I don't know, Attaway, what to think of it, Mays responded. Do you think they will kill all of us? Yes, I do. I think so. Just so, said Mays. Do you think they will kill me? Attaway asked finally. I do, said Mays. All you've got to do now is pray to God to save your soul. Just give up your wife and children and everything else, for they are going to kill you. With that, Attaway hung his head and commenced uh, crying. There was actually terrific disagreement among the whites about just what to do. Some of them just wanted to, they're in a ring right around the African-American prisoners. They just want to open the ring up and turn it into a firing line. 
uh, and be done with it. One uh, white named Bill Robinson, who had been the son of a judge, says, no, no, now gentlemen, the way to do it is go and hold a court martial, and whatever the court martial determines you can do, uh, then you can do it. And with that, a small detachment moved away from the ring. They probably consulted uh, with General Butler. Uh, certainly, they drew up a list. Attaway, uh, as Getson, remember Henry Getson, one of the boys in the wagon, as Getson is, uh, and Tommy are leaving to consult and to draw up a list, Attaway says, do all you can for me, Attaway begged of Getson while the court martial was meeting. Yes, God damn you, I will do all I can for you. I will do it in a short while. I will fix you now in a short while. Getson and Tommy come back. Hadaway's is the first name they call. They carry him down to a low oak field right there where they shoot him in the head. They come back to the ring and they do that four more times. The last time they call a name Pompey Curry. At the sound of his name, he's up and running. He runs as fast as he can. Um, he's gunned down uh, and presumed dead. And one of the gunmen says, what better fun do you want than that? In fact, Curry hadn't been killed, and that's the reason that we have verbatim the quotations from inside uh, the dead ring. So what do you do the next day? You convene a coroner's inquest. Remember how we started our whole conversation, is that the wheels of justice do not turn until the coroner makes a, present, a pronouncement. This is a place where African Americans actually control the coroner's office and civil society. And we write so many books about massacres and about lynchings. I wish we wrote more books about what you do the next day to pick up the pieces. And in this case, Prince Rivers stood over the dead bodies of those six men and convened a coroner's inquest, because that's what you do. And he gathers together the pages of the testimony and issues <coughs> arrest warrants for 87 white men, including Matthew Butler, future South Carolina senator, and Bill, Ben Tillman, future South Carolina governor. That inquest, of course, makes it here uh, to the New York Times. Unfortunately, it doesn't make it any farther. The wheels of justice turn no more. The straight outs, as they were called, were in ascendance, and Reconstruction was rolling back. To Rivers' dismay, there were no more links in the chain of justice. He tells his son Joshua, who was then interviewed by the WPA in the 1930s, he says, now it'll be 100 years. So he knows exactly what they lost at Hamburg. It wasn't that it happened. It was that the government wasn't going to do anything about it. OK, what happens to Rivers? He returns to driving a carriage. And to me, right, this is the arc. It isn't just the people who were brutalized or killed during Reconstruction. It is to take a person like Rivers, who could have been right in charge of the Army of the Potomac, who taught himself to read and write, uh, who'd been the mayor of a town and a state legislator, and all of those things. But his arc is from a carriage driver to a soldier, to a state legislator, to a mayor, and to a carriage driver again, driving white people around. Attired in his livery suit and tall beaver hat, said an admiring white witness, he looked like a piece of statuary. So erect in form was he. So what, mark, what markers or memorials are on the ground? How should we remember what happened at Hamburg? In 1916, they erected a monument to the massacre, uh, to, to the riot, as it was described by them. To McKee Merriweather, the lone white who'd been killed and promised to kill Jesus Christ himself, probably caught in the crossfire. And inscribed on that monument is, in life he exemplified the highest ideal of Anglo-Saxon civilization. By his death, he assured to the children of his beloved land the supremacy of that ideal, after which they watched Birth of a Nation. <laughs> and what monument remains? to Prince Rivers and all of the men of Hamburg. Where is Hamburg now? This is what happens to Hamburg. In 1911, the river floods, and basically Augusta has the money and the federal pool to get the Army of Corps of Engineers out to shore up the levees. 
Hamburg does not. In 1929, the next flood comes through, Hamburg washes away. All that they owned, all that they'd bought, none of it protected. All of it returned and now known as North, North Augusta. And here we are around the site of the Hamburg massacre. This is a golf resort with very well appointed streets, houses right on the river in prime real estate. What it would have meant to the African American community to have owned this today. How many millions of dollars might that be? I don't have anything against golf. Um, maybe gentrification would have happened anyway. My question is how do we remember? What markers remain on the land for us to remember? Here's the execution site. Remember that low oak field where they shot down Charles Attaway uh, and three others? And what is running over that site? That is the Jefferson Davis Memorial Highway. So that is just an example of the kind of story that you can write uh, from these inquests and that I hope you will write uh, in the weeks ahead. Does anybody have any questions about death investigation in the United States, the coroner's office in the 19th century South, or anything else? I know it's been another glum day in the history <laughs> of death and dying in the United States. I'll see you all on Tuesday. Thanks very much. Thanks for listening. Please rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org. Thank you.